Okay, so let's go ahead and get started today. So today, first we're gonna talk about a ship register. And a ship register is part of the final project individual where um, you'll be designing a four bit multiplier. And I'm gonna talk about the four bit multiplier in detail on Tuesday of next week. And Tuesday of next week, just to remind you again, this is in the syllabus and I talked about it on the first day. But Tuesday of next week is the last in person um, you know, meeting lecture. Because um, a week from today is an open lab. And then the last two weeks, again, it's devoted, uh, the time is devoted for you to work on uh, the final project, which again has two parts to it there's an individual part and there's a team part. And I'll talk in more detail, although. You know, the information I'll talk about is on campus, um, but I'll talk about it in class uh, Tuesday, the final project. Um, now, in addition to a good register, uh, we're also going to uh, go over sequence detection. And sequence detection um, is what you need to know for lab six. Okay, um, Lab six will be new a week from tomorrow, so Friday next week. And then remember, the next thing that's due lab wise is the um, lab five that's due tomorrow. So hopefully, people have at least gotten start, started on that and uh, are in the process of, of working on it. Okay, so first thing um, about chip registers is that there are two types of chip registers. Okay, one the acronym is the SRR, uh, the other one SLR. Uh, SRR stands for chip register. And SLR stands for ship left. Okay, what ship right means is that in this type of uh, ship register, the data. goes from the most significant bit to the least significant bit. So, you know, since we think of, uh, you know, the most significant bit being furthest to the right, right, the least significant bit being furthest to the left, well, the data is going to the right. Okay, so chip right. Uh, and then chip left register is just the opposite. The data goes from the least significant bit to the most significant bit. Okay, so those are just the two types of ship registers we have and um, you know how they're defined. So I think the best way to understand how a ship register uh, works is just to do a couple of examples. So uh, this first example I have would be for a ship right and now, you haven't seen this notation before, but this is a very common notation that's used for registers, is that you show a rectangle. You know, the rectangle represents the register, and then you have squares within the rectangle, and the squares represent the output or the outputs of the flip-flop that make up that register. Right? So remember, again, register a register is just made up of multiple flip-flops. Right, because each individual flip flop can store a bit. So if you want to store multiple bits, right, you got to have multiple flip flops. It's flip flop per bit. Okay, so this would be a register of eight flip flops. And what's shown in the square is just the output of each of those flip flops. So let's say that initially we have this data uh, in the ship register. Right, so this is our initial data here. Okay. And as I've written, you know, most significant bit is over here on the left, as you see, and most significant bit is over here on the right. And then there's this input. Um, as you can see, it's labeled dr underscore, and that's just data um, input for when you're doing the shift right. Okay, that's with the R, with the R means for doing the shift right. And, you know, let's say we make it equal to zero. If we could make it to equal to one, I decided to make it equal to zero. 
And then chef register, just like you know, memory registers or any um, type of device that um, has memory um, is edge triggered, right? So you have to know whether it's rising edge or falling edge. And in, in this first example, I decided to make it rising edge, okay? So if we have this initially, at the time of our rising edge of the clock, okay, so this is our clock here, and since it's rising edge, right at this time when the clock transitions from zero to one, the data on this DR input, this data is gonna go into the most significant bit of the register. Okay, so this zero is gonna go here. And then this one is gonna shift over one place. This one is gonna shift over one place. This zero is going to shift over one place. This zero is going to shift over one place, and so on. Okay, and then this last zero would just fall off the face of the earth. Nothing wouldn't have that that bit anymore. So, you know, that's why this device is called the ship register because um, when you set it up, as you can see here, at the time. Of the appropriate process, the one transition, you're going to get a shift in bits, right? So this data, this input comes into the register, and it's a shift right, it comes into a most significant bit, and then all the other bits just shift over one place. Okay? So, any questions about that? Because if you understood this, you'll understand a shift left, because the shift left is just going the opposite direction. Okay, so that's what the next example is. Okay, this is a shift left. So you'll have an input DL, which means you know data is D. L refers to its data for a shift left, and then of course in for input. And you know, just to remind you that there's two types of triggering, rising edge and falling edge. I made this example falling edge. Okay, but you could have a shift right that's falling edge, you could have a shift left that's rising. So you can use either. Yeah, I just mixed it up again for example purposes. Okay. Um, but no, let's say again, this is our initial data in our shift register. And let's say we put a one uh, for our uh, input data. Well, at the time that the clock transitions from a one to a zero, right, on the falling edge. This data here, since it's a shift left, this one would come into the least significant bit. And so this one would come in here, and then all the other bits would shift over one place. So this one comes over, this zero comes over, this one comes over, this one comes over, this zero comes over, this zero comes over, this one comes over, and then this zero here again would just go away because it's not a flip-flop thing to sort. Okay, so that's how uh, shift registers work, right? There's just the two types, you know, one shifts one direction, the other shifts the other direction. Now, the other thing is, um, and, and most people realize this, but sometimes uh, people make this mistake that, you know, it's called shift right because most of the time, you know, the most significant bit is furthest time to the left. So as the data is going in, you know, it's going in the right direction. The same thing with shift left because LSD, the least significant bit, is most often thought of or drawn furthest to the right. But since the data is coming in this way, you know, it's going to the left. But this is always true that the shift right goes most of the three bit, the least of the bit, and the shift left goes the least of the bit, the most of the bit, no matter how the register is oriented. You know, I could flip this around, right? I could put the most significant bit over here and the least significant bit over here. And it's shift right, it's still going most significant bit, the least significant bit, okay? Um, you know, I could draw these vertically, right? I could draw the shift registers vertically where the most significant bit's on top and the least significant bit's on the bottom. And if it shifts right, the data is going in a downward direction, right? But we don't have anything called shift down. <laughs> you know, so I just want to make that clear because sometimes people get tripped up.
especially in a lab situation. Right? Um, so anyways, so these are the definitions to remember. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so you might wonder, okay, what can you do with the ship register? Well, there's many things. Um, ship registers, as you're going to see on Tuesday uh, next week when I talk about binary multiplication, uh, ship registers are a main component um, when doing binary multiplication. And what I can show you um, at this point uh, along the same lines is that you can use the ship register to do either multiplication by a whole number power of two or division by a whole number power of two, okay? Because for example, if we started out with this data here, okay, one, one, zero, zero, and if we treated this as a binary number, what number would this be in base 10 that you consider it to be binary? It's 12, right? There's no one, no two, instead of four and eight, right? Well, if I shift left, one place and bring in a zero of the data that comes into the register, well, I would end up with this, right? I'd end up with one, one, zero, zero, zero. Right? If I did a sh shift to the left, right, bringing in a zero, so the zero would come in and then these bits would just shift one place over to the left like this. So if I start off with this, which is a 12 in base 10, and I do one shift left, bringing in a zero, what do I now have? What is this in binary now? 24, right? There's no ones, no twos, no fours, they have an eight and sixteen. So you see, if I do one shift left and bring in a zero, I do a multiply by two, right? Whatever number is there, I'm gonna multiply by two. And if I did another shift left and I brought in another zero, What number is that? In base 10. Forty-eight. See, every time you do a shift left and you bring in a zero, you're doing a times two. So if you do two shift lefts, right? We're bringing in two zeros, you're going to times four. Right? If I did a third one, times eight, right? Do a fourth one, times sixteen. So you can easily do multiplication by a whole number power of two by just shifting the appropriate number of bits to the left. Okay, so what do you think happens if I shift to the right and bring in zeros? But you divide by a whole number power of two, exactly. Because right? again, if I started with one, one, zero, zero, and I do, um, one shift right with bringing in a zero, I would end up with this, right, which is six. If I did another one, I have three. Right now, I ran out of space here, but if it had more bits, you know, I could do further. Uh, I could do divide by four, divide by eight, and so on. So when you take CPE 233, that microprocessor, as we mentioned before, has 32 bits, like it has 32 bit data, right? So you can do shifts. Of many bits in that class. And, um, you know, the other thing you learn in CP233 is you learn um, a different type of language called assembly language. Um, it's different than, you know, language you probably have learned, you know, computer languages that I uh, previously learned because assembly language um, is, is code that's close to the hardware. You know, they have commands that are basically moving data between registries, things like that. And you'll see when you take that class that there's instructions to the microprocessor that's shift left, so many bits. Well, bringing in this bit. If it's shift right, so many bits. Well, bringing in this bit. So you can use those instructions to have your microprocessor multiply or divide by a whole number power of two. Okay? All right, so the next thing is what we just talked about is really a you know your basic shift register, but there's also uh, what are called universal shift registers, where um, this type of shift register can 
do both shift left and shift right because there are some shift registers that only do shift left or only do shift right. But a universal shift register can do both left and right shifts. And it can also store data and it, uh, it can also be loaded like uh, a memory register. Okay, so universal shift registers, they can shift left, they can shift right, they can store data, So ship left, ship right, they can store data and you can load them. You know, load data like a like a memory register. Like a memory register. And this is a high-level black box diagram of a typical uh, universal ship register. So look, just like the register, you know, the memory register we talked about uh, prior to today, it has a Q output, here it's 8 bits, and it's got a D input, okay, also 8 bits. It's got a clear, right, just like a regular register, and it's got a clock input. But what's different here is that this uni universal ship register also has another input, most often labeled SEL for select. Okay, you saw that for a MUX. Although this is not a MUX, okay, but universal select, uh, universal shift registers often have a select input. And this select input depends or determines the mode of operation. Okay, since that select input is two bits, how many values can I get from those two bits? If I have two bits, I can represent how many values? Four, four right? Two to the two, right? Four. So you see, this universal shift register can do four different things, and the select bits determine which of the four things it's going to do. Okay. And on your table, each table should have a handout that has code for a shift register. And up on the board here, I just wrote a portion of that code. Okay. I just wrote the portion that's under the else, okay, the case statement. I didn't write all of it because everything above that are things we've talked about before. Okay, so there's nothing new. You should be able to figure out what's going on above uh, the else. But I did want to concentrate on this case statement because this case statement is what's used to model what this select input is doing. Right? Because the select input, like we said previously, has two bits, we have four options. Right, that gives us four options. And that's why we have a case statement here. Right? You see the case statement is sensitive to that select input. So when that select input changes, that's when this case is gonna be evaluated. So look, if these select bits are one, so if I have a zero one, well then the Q output is gonna be assigned to D. So that's just like when you enter data into a memory register, right? Did you know your register that we've talked about made of, of the D flip flop? Right, when enters or enable, right? Enter, enable, same thing. When that's activated, uh, we assign the Q output to whatever's on the D input. You know, we call that loading the register. But just like you load a memory register, this universal ship register, when you make the select equal to a one, it's going to load just like you're loading a memory register. Okay. Now, if you make the select a, a two, you make it a binary two, a one zero, well, look at what the code is here. Q is being assigned, and you can see here, inside braces, bits six to zero of the Q output, then there's a comma, and then there's a one bit zero. Do you remember in Verilog, system Verilog, what are the braces like? What's happening here? There it goes. Concatenation, right? See that it's taking bits six through zero. Right? So remember, we call the least significant bit zero, right? We call the most significant bit the highest number. So if we've got eight bits, this is going to be bit seven. 
So you see what this code is doing is it's taking these seven bits right here, right? Bit zero to bit six. And then it's going to join a zero to the right of bit zero. So you see it's going to take these bits and then put a zero to the right. So effectively what happens? That's a shift left. That's a shift left with a zero coming in. All right, so you see this code right here, this is modeling a shift left. Does everybody see that? See, that's one of the cool things you can do with concatenation. It's really easy to model a shift left, okay? So what do you think option three is then? Shift right. Shift right, right, because it's taking bits seven through one. So it's taking these seven bits and it's joining a zero to the left of the, the most important bit, right? So it's effectively shifting it right. So this is your shift right. Okay. Um, why, why do you think there's not a zero option? Because I could put, I could make both of these select bits zero, right? That can be a binary zero. Why do you think we don't have a zero in the case? The zero model? Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. That's the hold. That's the stored data. So you see, there is no zero option because that's the hold state. That's the memory. Also notice, oh, well, I should ask you. What else is missing here in a case statement when you look at that code? I mean, the zero is missing. Yeah, the default is missing too. And you see, here's a case where you wouldn't want a default, or I should say by leaving the default that, by leaving the default out, we're making the default a hold state. Right? Typically, you don't wanna make your default in anything that has memory something that's going to change the output, right? Because if you change the output and it's something that for whatever situation caused the default, you know, it caused, you know, something else bad to happen, you know, you could be like compounding the problem. Um, you know, in a case like this, the default is better to be just hold on to what you have. <laughs> okay, so, so this is one of the, um, cases where you, no pun intended, but you know, one of the situations with the case statement that uh, you wouldn't want to default. It's probably the only. Okay. All right. So that's shift registers. Now, um, again, the reason I bring shift registers up is you're going to see on Tuesday when we talk about binary multiplication. Um, well, I already showed you an example of how you can multiply by a whole number of power of two. Well, on Tuesday, we're going to talk about, well, what if you want to multiply by three or, you know, seven, you know, something that's other than um, a multiple or, yeah, multiple, a whole number of power of two, okay? So we'll, we'll discuss further um, binary multiplication on Tuesday. And you'll see that the binary multiplier that is part of the individual final project involves the shift register. And we give you the code. In fact, it's that code right there. We give you the file for it, okay? But, you know, I want you to understand what the code is doing, so. I thought it was worth going over. All right, so any, any questions up to this point? Because now we're gonna transition into something different. So any questions? They're all good. All right, so now, and let me turn the camera on. I don't have to turn it that much this time. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about sequence detection. And this is what lab six is all about. And the first thing about sequence detection is that there's two types. Okay, and here are the definitions. Um, there's a resetting sequence detection. And what resetting here means is, and this is really key because people miss this. 
Resetting means after a detection. Okay, so real key, after a detection, no prior bits can be part of a subsequent detection. Okay, that's what's meant by resetting in this context. You know, I know resetting for a register means the outputs go to zero, but that's not what resetting means here. Okay, again, it's, a, it's the same word, but it has different meaning under different contexts. Okay. Now, non-resetting, if you have a non-resetting sequence uh, detector, it's still after detection. Okay, so you know what I mean by these little double dashes. I just didn't want to have to rewrite what I just wrote. Okay, so, so if it's non-resetting after a detection, prior bits can be part of a subsequent detection. Okay, so you see that's the difference. With a resetting after a detection, no prior bits can be part of a subsequent detection. But if it's non-resetting after a detection, prior bits can be part of a subsequent detection. Okay, so that's what the definitions are. Now I'm gonna give an example and hopefully the example will make it crystal clear what the difference between the two is. Okay. All right, so here's an example. Oh, did I put my block on? Okay, so here's an example. Let's say we want to detect this sequence right here. We want to detect one, zero, one, one. And we get this string of bits, right? You know, T equal to zero is over here. And as time goes along, these bits are changing as you see, okay? R stands for resetting, and R stands for non-resetting, okay? So for resetting, let's see, the first, detection I would get would be right here. Okay, one, zero, one, one. So that's a detection, right? I'd have a detection after this bit. Okay, then we go along, we have another detection here. Right, we get another one, zero, one, one. Okay, then we go along, and we get another detection here. Okay, now before we go any further, let me do but non-resetting. Well, non-resetting, same thing. We'd have a detection here. We'd have a detection here. We'd have a detection here, but here's where they become different. Okay, here's where they become different. See, with the resetting, once you have a detection, you can't use any prior bits for a subsequent detection. So for non-resetting, see right here, it goes, you know, after this detection, if we were to include this one with this zero and this one and one, well, that's another sequence we're looking for. But with the resetting, you can't count that one as part of a subsequent detection once you've had a detection. So for resetting, this would not be another detection. But for non-resetting, it would. Because for non-resetting, we can include a prior bit of a prior detection. So you see the non-resetting, you'd have this detection and then you would have another detection where with the resetting, this one wouldn't count, right? Because we can't use a bit from a, a previous detection. Okay, so these, see that's the key right here. That's the difference between the two is what's happening right here. I mean, to that point, they would be the same, but this is where they're different, All right? Can you see how that ties into our definitions? If everybody good because that's usually if someone has difficulty. Well, one difficulty is is people go back like to the old like an old definition of resetting. They think oh resetting everything goes to zero, you know. But again, resetting means something different, right? The key thing is these two things are only different after a detection. You got to have a detection first, and then that's where they become different. Okay. All right, well, the next thing, and this is, again, probably the most important thing, just like last class when we went over the state diagram for the first time, when you're doing any sort of sequence detector, okay, and I'm gonna go through this, this example in class, um, but lab six is you designing, um, you know, a different type of sequence detector. And you're, and you're gonna use an FSM for that sequence detector. 
Okay, and the first thing you always do before you design any sort of FSM is you make a state diagram. That's always where you start. Okay, so we're going to uh, make a state diagram to detect this 1011 sequence, and we'll do both a resetting and a non resetting. Okay, and we'll do it on the same state diagram so you can see the difference between the two. So, um, let me get back here. Remember, with um, a state diagram, you got to have a legend. In fact, on that activity, I think most tables included a legend, but I know there's a few that forgot. I don't know if it was in this section or my other section. So, don't forget a legend with your state diagram. Otherwise, the person looking at it doesn't necessarily know what's going on. So look at our legend here. Remember, the circle always represents a state. Okay, and then this Z that's inside the circle, what must that be? Because what always goes in the circle right here that we talked about last time? Yeah, that's a more output. So you see Z is a more output. All right, remember more outputs only depend on the state. So we have more output Z. And Z is going to equal a one when we detect one zero one one. Let me put this over to the left a little bit. It's going to get in the way of our sleep right now. So over here, Z equals a one when one zero one one detected. And if it's not detected, it's going to be a zero. Okay, and then X, X are the bits. So like in this example here, this was X. Okay, these are the bits to be detected. Bits. Being detected. Okay. All right, so we're gonna start here at state A. So since this is a starting point, obviously we don't have a detection yet. So Z is going to be zero. Okay. So first, I'm going to show uh, the state diagram for when we have the bits we're looking for. Right. So if we're in state A and we get a one, right, which is the first bit we're looking for, we're going to go to state B. Right. So you see, if we're in state A, and we get the first bit that we're looking for, that's going to take us to state B. Okay, well, clearly, when I'm state B, I still don't have a detection, right? Because I've only detected one bit, right? So the one. So, so Z is still going to be a zero. Okay, when I'm in state B, if I get the next bit I'm looking for, zero, it's going to take me to the next state. Okay, so a zero will take me to state C. Okay, but when I get to state C, I still haven't had a detection yet, right? Because I only have these two bits. So Z is still going to be a zero. Okay, to go to state D, I would need a one, right? Because that's the next bit in my sequence. So if I get a one, it's going to take me to state D, but I still don't have a detection. So Z is zero. And now if I get a one, after I've gotten a one, zero, one prior, well, then I have a detection, right? So one, zero, one, one, that's what I'm looking for. So Z would go to a one. Okay, so everybody see what I did there? That's the easy part. <laughs> okay, the part that can be tricky is what your state diagram looks like when you don't get the bits you're looking for, right, in the sequence. Okay, now before we do that, the next thing I'm gonna do, and this next step isn't you know, necessary for everyone, but I know for me, it helps. Okay, it helps me do the next step. And what that next um, thing I'm going to do is by each of the states, I'm going to write what it takes to get to that state. Now, A is where we start. So you, know, you just start there, right? It doesn't take anything to get to A because that's where you start. Um, but see, to get to state B, I need a one. Right, so I'm going to write a one. 
right? Because it takes a one to get the state B. To get the state C, it takes a one zero. To get the state D, it takes a one zero one. And then of course, to get the state E, well, that takes the sequence, right? One zero one one. That's when we have our sequence detected. Okay, I like to do this before I think about, well, what is the state diagram gonna look like when I get you know, bits outside the sequence I'm looking for. Okay, so let's start here at, uh, at state A. Well, if we're at the start, because the sequence starts with a one, well, that's what's gonna advance us, right? But if I get a zero instead, let, let's say the first bit is a zero, right? that's not part of my sequence. What do you think I'm gonna do in state A? Stay in state A. Yeah, you just wanna stay in state A, right? Because you're just waiting for that first one in your sequence. So in the state diagram, you would just do this. Right. From at the starting point, I don't get the first bit I'm looking for. I'm just going to wait, right? Just, I would just stay there. If I kept getting zeros, I would just stay there until I get my first one. Okay. So now I move to state B. You know, and it took a one to get there. Now to move on in the sequence, I need a zero. But what if I get a one in state B? What do you think I would do? Would you go back to A? How many people say we go back to A? How many people say something different? What do you say? Yeah, how many people say stay in B? How many people don't know? Okay. One large person anyway. Okay, well think about it. it. It took a one to get here, right? If I just continue to get ones, wouldn't I wanna just stay here? Right, because that's the first bit I'm looking for, right? Ah, uh, no, I'm I'm so glad you asked that question because again, that's the this is the most common thing that people have some difficulty with at first, and I'm sure you're not the only one. So I'm so glad you asked it. See, here's the key. After oh. a day, ah, see, see, there's no difference between these two until we get a detection. I'm so glad you asked that. Thanks. Yeah, everybody see that? That's the thing. There's no difference between these two until after we have a detection. The state diagram for both pipes is the same until we get a detection. Okay, great. I'm so glad you asked that. All right, so, I mean, do you see it now that we would just stay in state B if we get a one? Does that make sense? All right, so we just stay in state B. All right, so we're in state B. If we get a zero, we're gonna go to state C, right? And again, it took a one zero to get here. All right, what do you think we're gonna do if, if instead, um, well, wait a minute. We're in state C. All right, it took a one zero to get here. So in state C, if we get a one, we move on in the sequence, right? We go to state D. But now, if we're in state C and we get a zero, what do you think we're gonna do? Now, it took a one zero to get here, but we get a zero next. We're looking for this. And if, if it took a one zero to get here and then I get a zero, what do you think we're gonna have to do? Yeah, you just start over again, right? Because it took a one zero to get here. If now I get another zero, there's no way I'm gonna get this sequence, right? Because if this sequence doesn't have two zeros in a row. You see that? So if we're in state C and we get a zero, we're gonna go back to A. Everybody see that? See that? I think that's why if you write down what it takes to get to a state, it helps, right? Because it took a one zero to get here. If you get another zero, well, there's no way I can get the sequence I'm looking for. So I just start over again. Okay. All right. Well, now we're in state D and, you know, we're in state D and we get a one. You know, we got the sequence, right? But what if I'm in state D and it took a one, zero, one to get here and now I get a zero. Go to C, right, right, because C, C, 
takes a one zero. So we would just go back to C in that case if we get this here. It could be a little tricky, but again, I think if you write down what it takes to get to a state, I think it helps. At least it helps me. <laughs> All right. So now, like I said earlier, in response to a great question, what we have here is the same whether it's resetting or non-resetting. Because again, where it become where it can become different is now once you have a detection, there can be a difference in the state diagram depending on which one you have. Okay, so this is where I'm going to go to a different color. Okay, because well, let's write over here. Green is for both. Right, green, both, resetting and non-resetting. Okay, we'll do red or resetting. Okay, so if it's resetting. After you have a detection. So we got our detection here. So if it's resetting, once you have a detection, you can't use any prior bits for a subsequent detection. Okay. So it's resetting. We have this detection. We're in state E. And let's say we get a zero. <laughs> Where would you go? What state would you go from E? So we have a detection, you know, it's, it's one, zero, one, one, and then we get a zero. Okay. Yeah, you just go back to the start, right? Because we're looking for a one, right? So we would just go back to A. But what if we get a one? Right, so we got a detection, one, zero, one, one, and now we get a one. Mm -hmm. You go to B, right? Because it takes a one to get to B. So that would be the state diagram for a reset, right? Because again, the green is the same for both. And then you'd have the red once you have a detection for the reset. Everybody okay? Because the next one would be non resetting. So we got to use a different color here. I'll try orange. I don't know. I've never okay. tried orange before on the board. <clears throat> so this is uh, orange. Does that show up okay? It's not too bad, I guess. Not too bad. I usually use blue, but my blue's run out. I gotta get a refill for that. Orange, non-resetting. All right, so non-resetting. Okay, so we have a detection. And uh, let's say we get a one. So it's non-resetting, we get a one. I mean, we can use prior bits, but we're still looking for this. We're still looking for a one, zero, one, one. So does prior bits help us here? No, because we don't, we don't start off with two ones in a row, right? So where would we go? We go to B, right? Because again, it takes a one to get to B. Okay, but now, Again, we have a detection, and let's say it's non-resetting, and I get a zero after I have a detection. All right. Why is it C? That's right. Who said C? Oh, and why? Because it's non one, zero. Yeah, because it's non-resetting, I can use this bit from the previous detection, and one zero takes us to C. That would be the non resetting case is what's in green and orange. Okay, if, if you understood how we got the state diagram, then you should be able to do lab six without too much difficulty. Now, lab six is a little bit um, more than this, but if you understood this, I think you can figure out lab six. You have all ones, yeah, or just pick something where this is you want to come up and write what sequence you do, or I'm trying to think how would it be different? Are you just saying all ones? 
Yeah. Why don't you come up and write it so I can so I can understand. Maybe write it over here. Okay. It's like we're looking into this, and it's something like and now here and here. Oh, here. Like what would you do that? Okay. So let's see. Let's think about this. If it's if it's non-resetting after detection, you can't use previous bits. Which I well, I, are you saying this is like infinite? Are you just sure? Because I think if it's just infinite, would you just have? Well, you would still have more. Uh, well, you would still. Let, let's. I gotta think about this. Let's take this one. So let's say this just keeps going on. If it's not, if it's resetting first, okay, if it's resetting first, you know, we'd have a detection here, then we'd have a detection here, because if it's resetting, you can't use previous bits. All right, so it would just keep going like that. If it's non resetting, you'd have more detections, right? Because non resetting, you would have this first one, and then you can use previous bits. So you know, you'd have like that. And then let's see here, you'd have like that. So it's just, yeah, you'd have a lot more detections with the non resetting. Okay, right. And it's just, you know, when you're at this bit, you know, you go three bits back, right? Because you're looking for four one. But, you know, if it was more ones, then it would take longer for the non resettings to start, you know. You would have to change any of the logic, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, we would have a different state diagram than, you know, this one, of course, you know, depending on the sequence, you know, your state diagram is going to be different. But, you know, once you have the state diagram, like we talked about last class, you know, you would just take that and, and go into that format that I gave you for the Verilog modeling. So, okay. I mean, the approach isn't different. But that's a, a great question. Yeah, I never thought about that. But yeah, it's just to get more detections with the non resetting Okay, any other questions about this? Because um, there's a few more things I want to do. I want to show you a couple of things on Canvas. I also want to talk about the next three weeks. Even though a lot of this is on Canvas, I just want to remind people if you haven't looked at the syllabus in a while. Uh, but let's uh, let's take a look at the activity in lab six on Canvas, just because I want to point out a few things. So the activity, it's just um, a couple of timing diagrams with a universal chip register. So, yeah, I know the resolution is terrible, but on Canvas, it's nice and clear. Um, but this universal chip register is just like the one that we talked about uh, a little while ago in class. It has two select lines, hold for zero. Parallel load is the same as the load we've been talking about where Q just equals B, um, right shift, left shift. So you're given a tiny diagram. Also note that you are given an initial value for D out. Like right here, it says initially D out, which is the same as Q, um, is hex 45. Okay, and all the values here are in hex. So you just want to um, come up with what the output would be for these various inputs that we have. Also, let's see, yes, we're told that the clock is rising at, right? So the zero to one transitions are the ones uh, that matter. Okay, so, you know, if this made sense to you over here, you should be able, and if you 
understand timing diagrams. I actually have looked at a few of the timing diagrams of the midterm. Uh, I was able to do a little bit more grading yesterday. I'm still not finished, but I'll have them Tuesday. I'll have the scores on Tuesday. And um, I, I was a little disappointed um, because more people than what I thought had some difficulty with that timing diagram. So I would, I would think at this point of the quarter, because you've done so many labs, right, with the Bovado, and you got to look at a timing diagram every time you simulate, I would think timing diagrams would not be too bad, but I'm, I'm starting to worry that people may not be doing simulations or not enough simulations when they do Bovado. You know, again, if, if you're just going from, uh, you know, right to the board and not simulating your designs, um, you're gonna really run into trouble when you take 233 because in 233 you don't even download anything to the board until like the last two weeks. The first eight weeks of that class, you're testing each, each piece of that microprocessor by looking at a timing diagram. So if if you're still having difficulty with a timing diagram, you know, get help with that. Whether it's a person in your group or ask me questions, but yeah, it's important to understand timing diagrams. So. Okay, but anyway, that's the activity. And then, now, it, it's labeled lab seven, but it's really lab six. So that should be lab six. Um, but this is the sequence detector that's lab six. And in this lab, we want you to be able to detect two sequences. Okay, there's a sequence 011101 and a sequence 011001. And if you take a look at these sequences, they only differ by one bit. Um, it's the fourth bit that is different. Okay. And based on the position of a button, you're looking for one or the other of these sequences. Okay, when the button is pressed, you're looking for this sequence. When the button is not pressed, you're looking for the other sequence. Okay, so before you do anything, you know, before you even make a project folder, you know, for your Verilog files, you need to do a state diagram. Now, now there's two different approaches I've seen that work. I've seen people, including myself, do one state diagram. Okay, and within that one state diagram are both sequences. I've also seen people do two separate state diagrams, you know, one for this sequence, one for the other sequence. Okay, and they're both equally good. Okay, so it's, it's personal preference whether you want to try it one state diagram or two state diagrams. Okay, it's up to you. So that's where you start. You got to start with the state diagram because once you have the state diagram, you can go right into the Verilog code to model the FSM um, with that format that I gave you uh, last class. So if you look at the structural model, Okay, here's the modules. The only module that you're creating is the FSM, okay? Uh, this is a clock divider. Remember, we talked about a clock divider at the beginning of last class. Uh, this is a sequence called the sequence driver, and this is labeled BC deck. These three modules are given to you, okay? These three modules Dr. Mueller designed, and they're in VH, uh, VHDL. Okay, which um, is a different language than Verilog or System Verilog. But as I have explained earlier, Vivado will run mixed files. Now you've seen in lab five, it will, it will run Verilog with System Verilog. Well, it will also run the HDL along with uh, System Verilog or Verilog. Okay, so these files are on campus. Yeah, see right here, it, um, um, it ends in .vhd, okay, the .vhd um, file, which is for VHDL. But there's a clock divide to sequence driver and also um, the VC dash. Now, what those modules are doing, <clears throat> well, the clock divider we talked about. What is this clock divider doing? What does the clock divider do? Like the one we talked about last time? Yeah, it just slows down the clock frequency. So it's called a divide by two because it's dividing the clock frequency down by two. Now, also remember 
last class, I talked about how by just changing an integer, right? And our example was max count. You could change how much the clock is being divided by. Well, I'll explain when I show you a video coming up that you'll have to go into this file. Now it's DHDL, so it's not gonna look anything like Verilog. It looks much different. However, you should be able to figure out the integer that you have to change because there's an integer you're gonna have to change in here to slow the clock down more okay, than what it was designed for. And I'll explain why when we watch the video coming up uh, shortly. Now, this sequence driver, what this module is doing, and if you look here, the input to the sequence driver are the switches, eight switches. Okay, so eight switches on your basis board, that's the input to this module. And then the output, well, there's a couple of outputs. One output of the sequence driver goes to uh, the X input of your FSM. And then there's another output of the sequence driver that goes to uh, LEDs, okay, eight different LEDs that are on your basis board. Well, what this sequence driver is doing is it's taking the data based on the position of the switches, your eight switches, and it's putting that data all on one output. So coming out of the sequence driver, that's your series of bits. You know, that's, that's here, right? This X, it's just gonna be a series of bits on the same output that your FSM is trying to detect the sequences that we talked about earlier, okay, those two sequences. Okay, so this sequence driver is, is basically converting the data on your switches into the data that's going into your sequence detector FSM. Okay. Um, now this module over here, um, a lot of students call this module the cool crap uh, module because Dr. Mealy designed this such that when you have a detection, see the only input besides the clock into this BC deck is the output of your FSM. So just like we talked about in the example we did on the board, the output of your uh, sequence detector, right? In this case, your sequence detector FSM, it should be a zero until you detect the sequence you're looking for. When you detect the sequence you're looking for, that output should go to one. So Dr. Mealy designed this module such that when the input is a zero, meaning you don't have a detection, it's gonna display crap. When you do have a detection, and this is one, it's gonna display cool, okay? So that's what that module is all about. Why he chose those words, I don't know. It's Dr. Meal. That's all, that's all I can say. Now, so, so that's you know an overview of how this works. Again, there's only one module you have to create, and that's the FSM that's doing the sequence detection that comes from your state diagram that you come up with. These other modules are provided, okay? Now, let me show you a video that shows a working sequence. So you see the lights here, and you know I have this set up for a detection. So you see how it's crap, and then once it goes through all eight switches and it detects, it changes the cool. Now, by the way, this video doesn't show all the test cases. It shows only three of the four you have to do. Because this is detected with um, this button not pressed. Now I made it so it won't detect it because I put in a different sequence. I changed the scope. So you see, it just stays crap. Now, notice the speed of the LEDs. Okay, now it's gonna, with the button pressed, it will go to cool because that's the sequence, the other sequence. Okay, so I'm only showing three of the four test cases. There's a fourth test case I don't show where when the button's pressed, you don't get a detection. Okay. Now, you see how nice and, you know, not real slow, but, you know, uh, at a pretty good rate, the LED is going. That's because I changed the integer that's in that clock divider. If you don't change the integer, this goes much faster. Like it just, <laughs> okay, it's too fast for, you know, most people, including old people like myself to really see this change. Like, you know, it, 
when it goes past the pool, it just like flashes, you know, really quick. So when you change that integer, like I'm not gonna tell you what to change it to, and there's no exact answer, but change it to an integer so that the speed is similar to what you see in this video, okay? All right, now the last thing, The last thing is, I just want to go over what's happening. The next, you know, last three weeks of the quarter, since we're getting near the end. Again, this is on Canvas, but I just want to remind people might be a while since you looked at the syllabus, so. Uh, but for the next three weeks, um, our last meeting in class in person is Tuesday of next week. And that's when I'm gonna talk about binary multiplication. You'll have to know something about uh, this device called an accumulator, so I'll talk about that too. And then I'm gonna go over the final project. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the quarter, there is no final exam. Okay, no final exam in this class, but there is a final project. It has two parts to it. There's an individual part and a team part. Um, I will talk in detail about that on Tuesday. So it'd be important to be here so you get all the um, right information. Okay, Thursday of next week, that's an open lab. Okay, so, you know, if you don't want to come to class, that's fine. Um, but if you come to class, um, I'll ask the ISAs to be here at least a portion of the time. I will be available at least on Zoom. I might be on campus that day. I don't know yet, but I'm available, uh, you know, if you need help during the open lab, either Zoom or, you know, maybe in person if I'm on campus. And then the last two weeks, if we don't have class, there's no lecture or anything. Um, but that's time for you to work on your final project. And there's two parts to the final project. There's an individual, which is the binary, the four-bit binary multiplier that I'm going to talk about on Tuesday. And then there's the team uh, part of the final project where your team decides what you want to do. Now, there's criteria that you have to meet for a certain grade. I'm going to go over that on Tuesday. Okay. Um, but the reason th there's no class the last two weeks is is to give you time so you can work on that because that the final project is in lieu of the exam, right? It's like a final exam, but it's a project instead. Okay, I mean, some instructors do a final project and a final exam, but I think that's too much. I think a final project since you've had a midterm, you know, is enough, okay? Strangely, some students like final exams. I never like final exams, but there are a few people that like it. Uh, anyway, we only have a final project. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, and then the, the only other thing I wanted to talk about here, unless you have questions, is the remaining lab assignments, the due dates. Uh, remember, tomorrow, lab five is due. Now, here's something um, to take note of. Lab six, which is the sequence detector that's due a week from this Friday, so Friday of next week, that is individual. Each student has to turn a lab six in. Right? I mean, Lab zero through lab five, right? Each person's working independently, but the group just passes in one lab work. For lab six, every student has to pass in lab work. Now you can still work together, but each person of the group uh, passes in the lab work. And the reason for that is you're gonna have to do that for the final project individual. So I'm, I'm kind of prepping you <laughs> that um, for the final project individual, you'll also have to turn in, you know, everyone will have to turn in uh, their final project individual. Okay, again, even with the final project individual, you can work together, that's fine, but what you submit is individual for both lab six and the final project individual. Okay, does that make sense? And then, um, you know, the due dates for the final projects, uh, the individual is the Friday of the ninth week, so the second of June, and then for the team, it's the Friday of the of the tenth week, so it's the last day of the quarter. Okay, so if you get everything in on time, 
you won't have anything to do for this class during finals week. You can concentrate on your other classes. Okay. So do you have any questions before you get started today? You want to do the activity first? And then uh, there's still some people that I haven't checked off for the activity where you drag over an intermediate signal. So I think about half the class hasn't shown me yet. So if you're not sure, I can tell you whether I marked you off or not. If you know you haven't been marked off, then you know make sure you do that before you leave today. Okay? All right. Well, questions come up, please ask. And uh, Kathy should be here in about 45 minutes to help out. <laughs>